up and welcome back to Beyond the Art with Brandon Silvers. As always, I am your host, Brandon Silvers. All right, this time of year is exhausting for me. I hate the time change. I don't like cold weather, even though it hadn't really been cold yet, but that's probably a whole different problem. Uh, I like the holidays, but they're exhausting for a number of different reasons. And I always feel terrible because I eat every dessert place in front of me. However, there is one thing that I do like about this time of year, and that is the start of college basketball season. And I watched both season openers for the Lady Gamecocks and the men's team last week, and they were almost complete opposites in terms of feel. The Lady Gamecocks had their ring ceremony for winning the national championship last year. The second one they've won under coach Don Staley probably would have been the third if COVID hadn't canceled March Madness that year and made us all watch Tiger King instead. And they're the favorites to win it again this year, and they open the season after that ring ceremony with a dominant 70-point, that's right, 7-0-point win over East Tennessee State. And the men's team played the next night in the first game of the Lamont-Paris coaching era. Paris replaces Frank Martin, who lasted a decade basically because he led the team to the Final Four one year. I still believe they would have won the national championship that year if Sandarius Thornwell hadn't gotten the flu. But that's neither here nor there at this point. And Martin didn't really do anything else except hang around too long. So here comes Paris, a year after leading Chattanooga to the tournament, trying to right this ship. And they scrape by with a three-point win against South Carolina State to open the season. Now, a win is a win, but this probably isn't a team you'll be seeing in March. And the same can be said for most of the men's programs around the state. Clemson is projected to finish near the bottom of the ACC. You got College of Charleston down here. They're probably the the South Carolina team with the best chance to make some noise in March. Now, as you know, I'm a big basketball fan. So instead of doing a college basketball preview and crying on camera, I want to take a look back at the golden era of college basketball in the state of South Carolina. And let's also talk about what can be learned from that era to improve programs today. First off, let me pause and give you a chance to guess which season I'm talking about. Drum roll, please. If you guessed the 1996-97 season, congratulations. Please claim your prize at the desk. Let's see what the landscape was looking like. All right, first up, let's take a look at the Clemson Tigers that year. As a Gamecock fan, I hate Clemson, but that team was fun to watch. They actually had the best March performance of all the teams I'm talking about today. They opened the season with a huge win over eventual national runner-up Kentucky and started 16-1, and getting as high as number two in the national rankings. Now, after that hot start, they came back down to earth a little bit, but they made a run to the Sweet 16, where they lost to Minnesota in a ridiculous double overtime game where Bobby Jackson and his headband and high socks scored 36 points for the Golden Gophers. Now, Clemson was coached by Rick Barnes, who went on to coach for Texas and now coaches for the University of Tennessee. This is a man who loves the color orange. And they really had some talent on that team. Harold Jamison and Greg Buckner each went on to play in the NBA. But the guy on that team that had my attention was Terrell McIntyre. So a little bit of background information here. As a child, I was obsessed with height. I very much wanted to be 7 foot 11. Although to be fair, I never considered the health ramifications of doing this. Or the fact that there was really nothing in my DNA that would allow this to happen. So... Spoiler alert for those who have never met me in person, I didn't make it to seven foot 11. I didn't even make it to seven foot 10. But I was very obsessed with extremely tall basketball players and extremely short basketball players, even though I knew I didn't want to be short myself. But Terrell McIntyre was a very short basketball player. He was listed at five foot nine, and even that seemed generous. I was like eight years old, and I already knew how important height was to basketball. I mean, that's part of the reason why I wanted to be seven foot 11. So to see this little guy buzzing around out there was absolutely fascinating to me because it went against every preconceived notion that I had about basketball and height. He was their second leading scorer that year, a knockdown three-point shooter. He'd probably be more of the focus of their offense in today's game, and he also led the team in assists. So Terrell McIntyre was the man to me. And I mentioned this team came back down to earth after getting as high as number two in the top 25, and they finished 23-10 and 10 overall even after that Sweet 16 run. They've only been back to the Sweet 16 one time since that season, and they finished that year ranked 14th in the final AP poll and haven't finished a season ranked that high since. And as a hater, I can only hope the same thing happens to their football team. Speaking of things that depressed me as a Gamecock fan, that 1996-97 season was their best since they joined the SEC in 1991. 
Coach Eddie Fogler put together a hell of a team. They started off a shaky 4-4, four and four, including a loss to Clemson, where they only scored 39 points, but they went on to win 15 of their 16 conference games, including beating Kentucky at Kentucky and being ranked third in the country. They had Larry Davis, who averaged an absurd 45 points per game his senior year of high school and won a national championship at North Carolina before transferring to play for the Gamecocks. They had star point guard Melvin Watson, who was from right here in Charleston and went to Burke High School. But the man on that team was B.J. Mackey. B.J. was a sophomore that year, but he led the team in scoring and he would go on to graduate as the all-time leading scorer in Gamecock basketball history. BJ was a big time recruit from Irmo, and back when newspapers were a thing, they'd have the Parade magazine in the Sunday paper. At the end of every basketball season, they'd name their Parade High School All-Americans, and I'd read through it to see if there was anybody who was extra tall or extra short, as well if there was anybody from South Carolina. BJ was a Parade All-American his senior year of high school. And after college, he'd go on to have the pleasure of working with yours truly when he played for the Logators. And he was an undersized shooting guard who, like Terrell McIntyre, although BJ was bigger, would have been a lot better in today's game. But he was incredible then as well. So this Gamecock team basically comes out of nowhere to have this incredible regular season. They end up being a number two seed in the NCAA tournament where they had to play Coppin State in the first round. And in true Gamecock fashion, they proceeded to become just the third number two seed ever to lose in the first round. It's happened seven times since, but no number two seed has ever lost by as many points as the Gamecocks did that year when they lost by 13. What's great is they were a three seed the next year and were again upset in the first round. Shout out to consistency. And they have never replicated that season's success. They've never been ranked as high as four since, and they certainly have never been the number two seed in the tournament since. In fact, they've only made the tournament three times since that season. Now, as Gamecock fans, we do have back-to-back NIT championships to look back on, but that's about it. Oh, and also that Final Four run that I talked about earlier, but Frank Martin didn't capitalize on it. So I, there are things, maybe. Quick fun fact to close out our look back on that Gamecock team. Of all the talent they had, only one player from that team ever played in the NBA. The legendary Ryan Stack. Yeah, go ahead and Google him. He's real. So I say my favorite team from that era for last, the College of Charleston Cougars. I cannot overstate how good these Cougars teams were. Gonzaga was a mid-major team that was able to develop into a national powerhouse. And when I tell you that Gonzaga is really just the 1990s Cougars 2.0, I'm not exaggerating. There's definitely an alternate universe where CFC is a national powerhouse and where I'm 7 foot 11. Okay, so Coach John Crest built that program. He was a longtime assistant of coaching legend Lou Carnesecca, and he came down here in 1979 to start coaching the Cougars. Back then, they were in the NAIA, and he built them into a powerhouse there almost immediately, and they won the NAIA National Championship in 1983. They eventually joined the NCAA, and they really didn't miss a step at all. They made their first tournament in 1994. And this 1996-97 team was the best of them all. They didn't lose a conference game all year. They only lost to Kentucky and Oklahoma State in the regular season. And at one point, they won 23 games in a row. That includes upsets over major programs Stanford and Arizona State. And they were stacked, particularly for a mid-major program at the time. Thad Delaney was flat out dominant in the post. If he were like two inches taller, he would have played in the NBA. He's another guy who got to play for the Logators when I was a ball boy, which was probably more meaningful for him than playing in the NBA anyway. So seriously, though, one of the nicest guys, particularly when I look back and realize how annoying I must have been. The Cougars starting point guard that year, Anthony Johnson, did play in the NBA. He was a prototypical traditional point guard who controlled the game on both ends of the court. He finished sixth in the nation in assists that year, and he was also a hard-nosed defender. They were both seniors that year, and they were joined by another senior, Stacey Harris, who was a great scorer and probably had the talent to be conference player of the year if he wasn't on the team with Thad and AJ. Now, they had another senior contributor who was single-handedly responsible for robbing me of an MVP award at the Anthony Johnson basketball camp years later, so I shall not mention his name until that wrong has been righted. I'm demanding a full written apology and the chance at the age of 33, I'll be 34 then actually, but to be presented with an MVP award that was taken from me in front of this year's campers. 
They also had a lot of underclassmen depth and guys who didn't rob me of camp awards, like future two-time conference player of the year Cedric Weber, former Burke High School standout Jamel President, and Shane McCravey. So they get into the tournament as a 12 seed and are matched up against a pretty good Maryland team in the first round, and they just punch them in the mouth. They won 75 to 66, incredible all-around performances all around from Anthony Johnson, who had 17 points and nine assists. Thad Delaney had 12 points, eight boards, six blocks, and four steals, and Stacey Harris dropped 22 points. And their next game was against Arizona, and they were actually winning by a point at halftime before Arizona warmed down and won by just four points. But again, it was another great performance. Stacey Harris dropped 25 points, AJ had 14 points and six assists, and Thad had 14 points and 13 rebounds. And that Arizona team actually ended up winning the national championship that year, and they had five future NBA players, including Michael Dickerson, Jason Terry, and Mike Bibby. But they almost lost to the Cinderella from Charleston. And this was right when my love for basketball really started taking off, so having this team in my backyard was a dream come true. My mom and Mimi surprised me by signing me up for the CFC basketball camp this summer after this tournament, and I cannot put into words what it meant for me to see these guys up close and personal. They were superheroes to me. Getting to hear Coach Kress in his thick Brooklyn accent telling stories about Julius Irving or having Anthony Johnson make a surprise appearance after getting drafted by the Kings after I'd been watching all these guys on TV was wild. So that AJ guest appearance stands out to me because I had become a nice little player by this point and I wanted to show him that, you know, I'm headed to the NBA as well. Now, he was only there for a little bit, but he offered to shoot some free throws to entertain us and I decided to rebound for him and instead of just tossing the ball back to him, I threw him a behind the back pass. Now, I had never thrown a behind the back pass before because you need long arms to do that and I was eight years old and not seven foot 11, I remind you, but I'm confident and I'm trying to make a great impression. Not a good one, a great one. And I can certainly say that I made an impression because I defied the laws of physics when I threw it, I still don't know where it went. I threw it to whatever dimension it is where I'm seven foot 11. I can still see the confused expression on his face as he tried to process what the hell happened to the ball. But anyways, I fell in love with that program, and they never made the second round again, but that was the start of three straight NCAA tournament appearances for them. They were in eight seed in 1999 after going undefeated in conference play in their first season in the SOCON, and my mom and Mimi called the local news stations to see where the bus was going to drop the players off when they came back after losing to Tulsa in the first round that year. And we headed on down to George Street to stand in front of the F. Mitchell Johnson Center and just wait. Just us and some local news crews, and the guys could not have been any cooler when they finally got there. Some of them recognized me from camp. I got all kinds of autographs and pictures and all kind of stuff. I don't know where the pictures are. I probably need to find them, but it was just such an amazing experience. And that was the year they upset number three North Carolina on a Danny Johnson tip-in, so I was a Danny Johnson fanatic, and getting to meet him was unreal. And as you can imagine, I was devastated a couple years later when Coach Crest retired, that program just hasn't really been the same since. One of the reasons for that has to do with how coaches view programs. Coach Kress was here forever, basically. 23 years, he built the program, they named the arena after him, he made the College Basketball Hall of Fame. But it's so incredibly rare to find a coach who looks at a mid-major program as anything other than a stepping stone to a major program. And that's a real shame because, as Mark Few has shown at Gonzaga, you don't have to be from a traditional Power 5 conference to build a powerhouse program, particularly in basketball. And you see that here where CFC is on their fifth coach since Coach Crest retired in 2001. Now, Clemson and South Carolina are Power 5 programs, even if South Carolina doesn't always act like it in men's basketball and football. So what's their problem? Well, the biggest reason none of these schools has been able to replicate the success of that 1996-97 season is the failure to recruit in-state. Look at that CFC team. They had Anthony Johnson from North Charleston, Jamel President from downtown Charleston, Thad Delaney and Cedric Weber were from the Midlands. The bulk of their talent was always from South Carolina or coastal Georgia. That Gamecock team that year had B.J. Mackey from right there in Irmo, Melvin Watson down here, downtown Charleston, Larry Davis from Denmark, and then Clemson had Terrell McIntyre from Fayetteville and Harold Jamison from Orangeburg. Our in-state men's programs aren't getting the best in-state players consistently anymore, and they haven't for a long time. South Carolina lucked into Gigi Jackson this year, and when they have been good, it's been because of SC guys like Sundarius Thornwell, PJ Dozier, Devin Downey, same with Clemson. But they miss on the in-state guys far more than they get them. 
just in the past decade or so, think of all the talent this state has produced that's left here to go to college. Chris Middleton went to Texas A&M, Aaron Neesmith went to Vandy, Josiah Jordan James went to Tennessee, and those are all Charleston guys. And that's not even mentioning Zion Williamson, who went to Duke, or the most egregious miss, in my opinion, John ja Morant, who went to Murray State. Do you even know where Murray State is? So if we're going to make a comeback as a college basketball state, we cannot let our most talented players leave. We have more than enough talent here to make NCAA tournament trips a regular occurrence. College basketball certainly isn't as regional as it used to be, but there's still no excuse for missing on kids in your backyard. I mean, please, I am begging you, use your NIL money, do whatever you have to do to make college basketball a thing in South Carolina again so I can do a proper college basketball season preview or get as good as the Lady Gamecocks are so there's no preview necessary. They're just going to repeat and I can say that in one sentence and we can move on. All right, that will do it for this week's episode of Beyond the Arc with the decidedly not 7'11 Brandon Silvers. Keep subscribing, rating, reviewing, and sharing, as well as checking out the other content like Brett's Bets, which is the most entertaining college football show in the world, and Beyond the Bark, where my dog makes NFL picks. I will catch you next week.